we have to say, this is something some of you heard, and this is, uh, we're going to work on it, is, is there a heavy model problem in our environment? This gets a lot of people uh, upset and excited, uh, but it's, <clears throat> it's a good question to ask, <clears throat> because I don't think our government is addressing this very openly or as important as it could be. And this was done by Dan Lax. Many of you remember him. He gave a talk here about four years ago. Uh, Dr. Fisher invited him, and I found his data really uh, very compelling. <clears throat> and he did, what he does is he does an analysis of the NHANES, the National Health and Nutritional Evaluation Survey. And in this he found, and he published a paper uh, on August 9th, and what he found was that uh, mercury was detected in the blood of 2% of women aged 18 to 49 in 1999-2000 inane study. That level rose to 30% of women by the 2005 and 6. I don't know what it is today, but I would surmise it's higher. So you went from 2% of the women having, uh, you know, detected inorganic mercury in their blood up to 30%, a 15-fold increase. <clears throat> and they didn't do anything to change their diet, etc. But his... Uh, his uh, paper said, my findings also suggest a high risk, rise in risk for disease associated with mercury over time. And I would tell you, one of those risks he called it was Alzheimer's disease. And he did this by biomarkers that he thought were related to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the pituitary hormone lutropin and chronic mercury exposure, which he said tie, might help explain mercury's tie in to uh, neural degenerative disease. And it says, these results suggest that chronic mercury exposure has reached a critical level where inorganic mercury deposition within the human body is accumulating over time. It is logical to assume that the risk associated with neural developmental and neural degenerative diseases will rise as well. And for the most part, he's been right. So we have, we have a problem, and there's nothing we can do about this. Uh, well, there is something. There's a lot we can do about it, but not with the, not with the regulatory agencies we have. Uh, and here's another one. Uh, this was, again, uh, pu published in 2012. And they, they're talking about high levels of mercury found in North Shore babies. This is North Shore, or Minnesota's North Shore uh, on the Great Lakes. Are born with unhealthy levels of mercury in their body, according to a re new report by the contamination around Lake Superior. The first look at for the pollutant in the blood of U.S. infants. This was done in 2012. Don't you think they're a day late and a dollar short? I mean, with, with the problems we're having, I mean, the uh, CDC reporting that we have one out of six children with a neural developmental disorder. There's got to be a cause for this. And, you know, I always throw into this because I always like it on any talk I give. The United States is one of the highest countries, has one of the highest infant mortality rates of the 43 most modern countries. We're almost at the very bottom of the list. Our children die at a higher rate than children from almost all other modern countries in Europe, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And when someone like uh, Paul Offit talks about how the vaccines are great and that uh, American people are fighting the vaccine program because of religious exemptions and that religion is going to destroy the uh, uh, vaccine program, you know, what's going to destroy the vaccine program are people who don't face up to the fact that it does not appear to be working. Ask anybody, anybody in the state agencies or at the CDC, what are our children dying of that gives us such a high infant death rate if indeed the vaccines are preventing death from infectious diseases such as whooping cough, mumps, etc. What are they dying of? Just give the data. Talk about it honestly. You cannot have an honest discussion with those people when they collect all the data, they keep it to themselves, and they only put it out if they want it to put out. And so we have a, a country that's got its head stuck in the sand with regard to protecting our children. Our children. And here's a mercury pollution on the amount of mercury put into the sky. This is a, a quite important. And you see Texas really has a, a high production of mercury. Uh, and this levels are up here, up to 1,000 pounds, this color, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 6,000 with this color, and over 11,700. Only Texas makes that one. And uh, we had a, a talk here some time ago. I can't remember, Palmer, I think it was the, the guy from Texas pointed out that the autism rate goes up dramatically if you live downstream from a Texas coal-fired power plant. 
at the level of mercury they're being exposed to. You know, when it gets into the baby's body, it doesn't care where that mercury comes from. It comes from a vaccine, the mother's dental amalgams, or coal-fired power plant. It builds up and it collects in her brain, and it's independent of the source. It, but it still has the same effect. So we have a problem that we have got to work on uh, in all these states, including the blue states here, my home right there, uh, that the mercury levels are too high to be acceptable, and we got to start lowering them. And I think we are. But here's the, one of the major problems. This is called the Mongolian flume. And if you look at this, here's a flume uh, you know, from uh, China and uh, Korea's and Japan. It's going out this way. And as you see, it's coming over here. And it comes over here and goes down the United States. And it comes into the United States in this area. And this is the reason we have fish advisories in the Rocky Mountain streams with trout because mercury from China, Korea, and Japan, because they have increased the number of coal-fired power plants and they burn dirty coal, uh, is coming into the United States now, and there's no way around it. This is the reason why Dan Lack's evaluation, looking at the government data from the Inhane study, showed that women are getting higher levels of mercury in the, the period of time that he talked about. It, it makes sense. There's nothing wild about this unless you don't believe in science. So we have a lot that we have to do, especially here and especially over here. We need to work with the Chinese and the Indians, et cetera, and try and get this level of mercury down because it's just too easy for it to come across here on the Mongolian flume, which I'll show in the next slide. This is not my stuff, by the way. This is just stuff I read. Uh, but you can see it comes out from uh, Mongolia and down and comes up. That's Alaska right there. This is uh, Washington State and Oregon, and there's California. It goes here, hits the jet stream, and goes across the United States, as many of you see every night on the weather reports. So we have, we have a problem. And I'm hoping, uh, you know, before we damage ourselves too much, that I can get a compound that everybody can pop on a day and not collect the mercury. And by the way, I, I don't do this for money. I'll give the money away. I'm 74 years old. I just want my grandkids to have a decent country to live in. And, you know, uh, the IAOMT will do real well if I uh, get successful with this compound and get past the FDA, as well as some other Ellen Mossonary groups. Uh, this is from a guy who's supposed to be up here speaking this morning, Dr. Ashner, whom I have a lot of respect for. I, I, I mean, I, I put some of the stuff in here, but basically, basically this is from one of the papers he did in 1990. Mercury, mercury neurotoxicity mechanisms of the blood-brain barrier transport. And what he's saying is that, you know, 80% of the mercury that we breathe goes into our lungs and stays in our body, gets into the blood, and there it gets converted from HG vapor, which is non-reactive, it can't do anything, to HG2 plus by an enzyme called catalase. It can happen in the erythrocytes, it can happen inside the cells of the body. Any cell that has catalase can do this. As a matter of fact, other cells can too. It can go across, 10% of it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it gets converted by catalase to HG2+. And there they report that they think it binds to certain enzymes inhibiting them, such as the enzymes that uh, uh, are important in brain function. I would tell you that one of the most reactive enzymes to mercury is creatine kinase, which is critical in every cell of the body. It has the most reactive sulfhydro group known in biochemistry. It reacts with mercury very quickly. You can knock creatine kinase with a one-to-one -one addition of mercury uh, to the enzyme. It binds that tightly. And in Alzheimer's disease brain, it's almost 100% inhibited, over 95% inhibited in AD brain versus age-matched control brain, indicating that mercury or something that reacts with sulfhydrals is primarily responsible. Now, if you can tell me something else that gets across your blood-brain barrier as effective as mercury and might be the cause, I mean, I'll listen to you. But I, I doubt you're going to find anything because I've looked like hell and I can't find anything. Nothing that you're exposed to, like <clears throat> some of you folks putting grams of mercury in the mouths of individuals that leaks off on a daily basis, and yet you can't convince our government or the American Dental Association that this is a problem. And yet, at this time, in the publications, you remember when I first spoke this in 1993, I think it was, I gave a talk to this academy in Chicago. <clears throat> it's a long time ago. And I thought you were all a bunch of kooks. I really did. I, I, I thought when I went there, I thought you were toxicologists, but you weren't. But, but at any rate, at that time, I thought this is going to be easy to solve. Just do the calculation. 
measure the amount of mercury coming off an amalgam filling is something a, an undergraduate kid could do. And I had undergraduate kids do that. And, you know, how the government says they can't measure that and they can't detect that and they don't know how much it, you, you know, you're, you're either an idiot or you're a liar. And I'm right now, have, I'm leaning really strongly toward the liar concept uh, from the FDA. They got, the, you cannot, you know, if, you, if your neighbor can lie to you and you believe every lie he says, he's just going to keep lying to you more and more and more. And sometimes you have to hold people accountable. If you have a position, then you should have the brains to address those problems properly. And our latest uh, response uh, from the FDA with regard to the dental amalgam safety was bull crap. Just pure bull crap. Because when they say the science isn't there, that's a lie. The science is there. It's all over the place. And you, I don't know how you can get them to do it. But the latest thing that I just told you, to you about from the University of Michigan Medical Center, medical school, saying that the Marisol is the major cause of autoimmune disease in uh, uh, women of childbearing age, the FDA will ignore that. That's what they do. Their job is to sit there and protect the product, products that are being made by industry that they want to sell. And I, and I hate to say that. You just have to tell them, but you have to start to call them for what they are. They're liars. I mean, as an institution, the FDA is just a big liar. And that doesn't help me at all to say that, by the way. Uh, but let's go on, let's go on and talk about uh, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease and a lot of neurological